Scope um, has over a decade of experience as a leading provider of enhanced due diligence reports and ESG reputational risk assessments. They really seek to empower financial professionals to evaluate various kinds of risks and with the goal of driving business. We enable professionals, not just financial professionals, but professionals from a lot of sectors and a lot of different forms of compliance to comply with AML, KYC, anti-corruption, and also terror finance regulations. Scope is a Luxembourg-based company, but our research center is located in Tel Aviv. However, beyond that, we're really a very, very international uh, company. As you can see, you know, I'm in Kansas, Love is in Tel Aviv right now. We've got analysts really spread over to every corner of the globe. We've got analysts in North and South America, Africa, the Middle East, uh, Europe, and um, the former Soviet areas, Asia. We've really got a deep understanding and ongoing expertise of regional issues, including the language skills, the cultural knowledge, um, and an understanding of the situation on the ground, uh, thanks to that, um, that human component um, that we have of our analysts, just with a lot of global and international experience, relevance, and locations. We serve over 200 leading financial institutions around the world, including in Luxembourg, Switzerland, Singapore, Monaco, Liechtenstein, a lot of other financial hubs. And um, we also really strive to ensure full confidentiality of our client's identity. Um, we have a strict Chinese wall policy in place that really allows our analysts to work freely and in an unbiased nature while protecting the identity of our, of our clients. And we have full compliance with all the GDPR requirements. Um, so really we're in a unique position, I think, to offer a lot of insight and help into an area that I think is frequently kind of overlooked or um, maybe not overlooked, but people tend to be really skittish when it comes to terror finance and you know, pull, you know, pull the plug really quick. So we really seek to uh, enhance the knowledge uh, employ methods that allow business to continue even in these higher risk jurisdictions or areas that people get pretty um, pretty nervous about operating in. So we hope that this uh, uh, presentation will help you to continue to do that and drive business in areas that a lot of people might be a little nervous to enter due to uh, that, that sort of hot button issue of terror finance. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Lev. Um, I hope you all enjoy and we'll have some questions at the end. So. We'll be, speak then. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm as excited as Catherine for this presentation, even though I'm doing it. Uh, I, really, I really enjoy this topic a lot. I find it super fascinating. Uh, it's an unfortunate topic to have to exist, but um, it, it is nevertheless really interesting and a lot of webs to untangle. And it's also very complex, as you'll see as I give this presentation. Um, I've, I've taken courses on terror financing. I read books on them. So, in the course of uh, the hour that we have together, we can't we can't put it all uh, we can't put all the information there. But I hope to cover the most relevant. And of course, at the end, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, and if there's anything that in the middle of the presentation you find uh, you can't continue following uh, without clarification, then do do feel free to write in the the chat, and uh, Catherine will pause me and uh, or answer it herself. Um, so like Adam said, my name is Levy Ditsky. I'm the, the head of intelligence here at Scope. Um, and I have, a, I have a similar background and experience um, in, in, uh, with, with terrorism, mostly through working for a company that did geopolitical risk consulting with that. And I, I particularly had a focus on terrorism, um, both in Africa and Middle East uh, and North Africa, as well as Europe. And I also, this was the focus of my, uh, of my master's and my master's thesis essentially uh, terrorism and how terrorism works. So it's super fascinating for me and also great that I'm in, I'm in a position now to bring that academic um, background into, into uh, the, the financial sector as well. And um, so I'm, I'm happy to present about it. Um, so firstly, just going over the agenda. So we're all on the same page of what will be presented on today. I'm going to do my best to define um, terror financing and, and if you don't know by now why you should care about terror financing. We'll talk, of course, about a very touchy subject. What is a terror finance? Oh, sorry, what is a terror organization? Because that's also not that clear or uh, it's definitely not black and white. Uh, we'll talk about the price tag of terror attacks, which is interesting because I think, uh, as you'll see, a lot of times when you look into price tags of terrorist attacks, people talk about how much it costs uh, the government that has to deal with it, but not as much people think about how much does it cost to actually conduct a terror attack. Uh, so it's a really interesting uh, uh, item to look into. 
we'll talk about the process of raising funds and using funds and uh, the, the pathway from one to the other, which includes also transferring funds. I'll talk also about the, the difference between terror finance and money laundering because they're often grouped together and for good reason, but they're also very different. And that also means that the red flags that I'll speak about towards the end are also going to be very different. And your approach, while similar and probably requires the same or it does require the same uh, sort of mentality and kind of uh, analytical approach, it is, it is different and you also have different things to look into. So let's start with this discussing what is terror financing. In the simplest terms, uh, the FATF defines it as, the, or the Financial Action Task Force defines it as the provision of money for terrorist acts, terrorists, and or terrorist organizations. So that's why I have to explain what a terrorist organization is later because I was taught in elementary school not to use uh, the, the, the word in its own definition. Um, so this, this is a, a FATF's definition. Uh, the World Bank describes it as the financial support in any form of terrorism or of those who encourage plan or engage in it. So it's, it's, it's quite broad um, the, way, the way it's approached. And like I said, it's often grouped with AML, with anti-money laundering as part of regulatory requirements, which is the reason you should care about it. On top of, if you have any moral reason to care about it, uh, even if you don't, there's also legislation uh, against the support of terrorism. You can get a lot of trouble for it. Compliance officers are required to make sure that they're, that they're doing their due diligence to ensure that, uh, that, the, that money from their clients or prospects aren't going to be associated with uh, terrorism. And most uh, AML acts are also anti-terror funding acts, have become anti-terror funding acts um, especially after 9-11. Um, it's often described as reverse money laundering uh, because essentially money laundering is when you take dirty money and turn it in, in, into clean money, but often with terror finance, you're taking clean money and making a dirty act with it, so to speak. So um, that's, why, that's why it's considered uh, reverse money laundering. I do think the definition is good um, as, a, as a starter, but it doesn't, um, really, uh, it doesn't really capture what terror financing is um, but I want to go over a bit about the, the difference between uh, terror financing and money laundering. So in brief, terror financing, the funds may be legal or illegal. So that's why I said it's not exactly reverse money laundering because a lot of terror financing, as you'll see, or the funds for terrorism do come from illegal sources. Um, so it's, it's not just taking legal money and turning it into illegal. It could be both. Um, the motivation for terror financing is... Uh, ideological for the most part. Um, it's not always as you'll see, but for the most part, it's, it's, uh, there's an ideology behind it. It could be religious, political, nationalistic. There are other kind of ideologies. There are terrorist groups that focus on um, animal rights, uh, animal rights and things like that. So it, 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 there's a lot of things that are covered, but the majority are religious, political, nationalistic, things like that. Um, the transactions for for uh, terror financing are often um, of smaller value compared to money laundering. And that's for many reasons. It's for those who participated in my money laundering webinars, you understand that the source of uh, money that's laundered is obviously, is, is often very large. Um, whereas with terror financing, it's the, the, the coffers are a lot smaller. And often with terror financing, you have a linear life cycle, which means you raise the money, you move the money and you bring it to the terror group. With money laundering, and I'll start in reverse, the difference between that is money laundering has a circular life cycle. Um, so the money eventually returns to the, to the originator of the money laundering scheme, essentially. If I, if I sell drugs, I want that money uh, back in a clean way. So it, it, comes, it comes back to me through the process of money laundering. The transactions are typically of larger value in most cases with money laundering. And when it's of smaller value, you don't really need to launder it because there's aren't, there aren't checks on you know, $5,000, for instance. So with money laundering, uh, the reason you have to go through the process is because you're often in the, in the millions of dollars. The motivation for money laundering is profit seeking. It's not usually ideological. And even though terror financiers, as you'll see, use money laundering sometimes or oftentimes, but uh, the motivation for the act is still uh, profit seeking money laundering, whereas in terror finance, it is ideological. And in money laundering, the money, their origin of the funds, the origin of money is illegal. That's, that's, that's what really separates it. So um, with that out of the way, I just want to talk briefly about the different motivating factors for money for terror financing. I, I already mentioned that it's, it's ideological. And, and I think what's important is a lot of times people 
forget now that there are other uh, terrorist organizations beyond Islamic ones, because um, that's where most of the literature is focused on and a lot of the discussion is focused on today. Uh, but they're also national and political ones. So uh, some of the important religious ones, for instance, uh, Hamas, Islamic State, or Islamic State, or ISIS, as uh, most people call it, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Lashkar Taliba, um, Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, uh, just very popular organizations that you've, you've heard of in the news a lot. But um, just as a reminder, there are other, many other um, nationalistically motivated ones and political, such as the Communist Party of India, Blood and Honor, which is a Canadian uh, Nazi oriented uh, terrorist group, uh, the Irish National Liberation Army. Uh, you have the Communist Party of the Philippines. The, the list really goes on. I mean, it's it's impossible to be exhaustive when it comes to terrorist organizations, but I do want to uh, put that framework in. It's also important to set the stage for later when I discuss the source of funds, because it does, you do see a difference when it comes to the funds um, received or, or the funds raised by religiously motivated terror groups and uh, more nationalistically ones. And, and uh, I'll, I'll get into that later. So as we discuss uh, again, we're we're getting into the topic of what are terrorist organizations. Um, these are some of the terrorist organizations. Um, I just want to, I want to show that um, different uh, bodies that decide what's a terrorist organization um, they don't always agree, and that's for different reasons. the The smaller the body, so to speak, the less uh, different governments that are involved in it, the more likely they're um, the the quicker they can list someone as a terrorist group or list someone as a as um, as a terrorist, it's very difficult for the United Nations with the amount of voices and the amount of um, governments that are in there and the amount of um, a, not manipulation, but the amount of um, disputes that are involved in the UN. It's, it's very difficult for them to agree on uh, on what's a terrorist organization. But it is easier for the EU and obviously for the US itself to agree because they have their um, a, it's, it's more unified. So you can see here as an example that. Uh, for instance, the, the, the U.S. Uh, Department of State has a uh, foreign terror organization list. Meanwhile, the U.S. Uh, Treasury Department uh, has the special designated global terrorist list, and they obviously agree with each other on who should be on it. Uh, meanwhile, the United Nations only includes Al-Qaeda as a terrorist organization out of this list here. And the EU includes Hamas, also includes Al-Qaeda, also includes the Communist Party of the Philippines, and uh, the ETA or the Basque Fatherland uh, and Liberty Party. So this is just an example um, of the way that different, uh, different bodies that list terrorist organizations can see if something is a terrorist organization or not. And again, the reason for this is that it's, it's highly political matter. Um, for, for one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. I know it's, uh, it's a very common thing to say, but, but it is true. And it means that a lot of governments, a lot of entities are supporting uh, terror groups and will push against it being called a terror group. Like obviously Iran would not include the IRGC as a terrorist group because it's part of the Iranian government. That's, that's just an example. Um, so it's very, it's very hard. And this is the, the point I want to make that it's, it's very difficult to actually decide who is a terrorist or what is a terrorist group. Um, usually uh, it's someone that's using violence or the threat of violence in order to push for their political uh, agenda. So that's, that's how it's uh, broadly defined. And that's again, why, why it's very difficult to determine, to identify, uh, to make a unified list of what is a terrorist organization. So, and we'll touch on, we'll get into, this is important uh, because I'll bring you this up again later, but I wanna move into a bit about the actual price tag of a terror attack. So how much does it cost to conduct a terror attack? Now, this is also a very complex question because it depends on the terrorist attack itself and also depends on what you consider as going into the a terror cost, right? Where you can, you can look at the operational cost, infrastructure cost, or you can look at just the cost of the equipment that was used in it um, and all the equipment that was used to lead up to it, for instance. So you can see a, a big variety of prices or big gap in prices here. For instance, uh, the 9-11 attacks in, in New York cost somewhere between 400 and 500,000 um, dollars. And there was obviously, it was, it was the deadliest terrorist attack in human history and killed almost 3,000 people and injured 25,000 and causing about $10 billion in infrastructure and property damage. But at the same time, there are also attacks that uh, left their mark. 
um, even though smaller size and also they cost a lot less. For instance, the, the Madrid train bombings, uh, they cost less than $15,000 to conduct. Uh, in 2015, the terrorist attacks in Paris, uh, they cost around $10,000 to commit. And um, the San Bernardino shootings in, in 2015 cost about $4,500,000 um, to conduct. And just some other costs that I think are interesting is a suicide vest. On average, a suicide vest costs about 1200 US dollars. A car bomb, uh, a suicide car bomb costs typically around 13 to $20,000. And a remote control bomb is about the price of a used iPhone. So it's about $400. And so it just shows you the range. And obviously there are terrorist attacks that are independently uh, conducted and, and don't really cost much money. Just someone decides to uh, take a knife and stab people on a train or in public. And this is uh, not saying that the costs there are essentially negligible. So now we talked a bit about how much the terrorist attack costs. The point of this webinar is to discuss where does the money come from? So essentially there are, it's considered uh, to be broken down to three different sources. You have money that's, uh, that comes from the state. So state sponsors of terrorists, and uh, then you have the ones that come from illegal origins. As you'll see, a lot of uh, terrorist organizations are involved in crime, especially uh, ransom, extortion, and uh, drug trafficking. And then you have money that's the origin is legal. Now, just because the origin is legal doesn't mean the transfer rate to a terrorist group is. Of course, that's not the case. But the origin of the money itself could be from a legitimate business or from a person who obtained that money entirely legally, but is using it to purchase something illegal, which is essentially the support and his stake or her stake in a terrorist organization. Um, and just a statistic that I found was interesting. So the Canadian Financial Intelligence Unit uh, examined 22 terrorist finance cases uh, from various jurisdictions. And in the review, they found that um, non-governmental organizations or nonprofit organizations are involved in over 45% of the of, uh, cases of terror financing, which is, which is massive. And that's money that's from completely, completely legal origins. And also shows, again, the difference between terror financing and money laundering that the reason this could happen is because the origins are, the, the, the motivation is very ideological. It was also noted that around 21% of the cases uh, out of these 22 that they researched involve some form of criminal activity, such as drug trafficking or fraud uh, and uh, extortion and things of that nature. So, just getting into the, the first source of funds that we were discussing is um, uh, the state sponsors of terrorists, of terrorism, sorry. Um, now, you might be surprised to learn that the US has a very small list of state sponsors of terrorism. And this is surprising because the US has a really long list of terror organizations. And mo not necessarily most, but um, I, would, I would venture to say, to say most actually, terrorist organizations do have some form of state sponsor. Uh, to some extent or the other. But despite that, despite the hundreds of organizations that the US includes as part of uh, as, as terror organizations, um, they only list four state sponsors. That's Iran for their support for Hezbollah, Hamas, PIJ, and the, or the past Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Houthis of Yemen. Uh, Syria also for supporting uh, Hamas, PIJ, and Hezbollah. North Korea, just because of their the state sponsored murder of King Jong Nam, uh, who was the Supreme Leader's half brother and uh, Cuba, who supported uh, FARC in Colombia and uh, Bas Fatherland Liberty uh, in, in Basque country of Spain. Now, the reason for this and the reason it, it, it's, it's complicated is because the US, there's a lot of countries out there who support terrorist organizations for um, pressure on a rival, political, a rival uh, country or rival entity. Uh, this is a very common approach. It's a very normal strategy in a way. And a lot of these are allies of the states. So naturally the states would not put someone uh, that even if they have troubled relationships with, they're not going to list them as supporting terrorists because essentially, again, if you define terrorism as loosely as it is, then everyone can be implicated in supporting terrorism. So um, because it's not official, I, I can't, uh, you know, for everything I say will be my own opinion, but naturally the PKK in Turkey uh, does have state sponsors. It, it, that's just one example. and. Um, you know, the U.S. itself support has uh, sponsored groups that others would consider terrorists in Syria, for instance, that's, that's natural, in Iraq. Um, and uh, the Saudis and the Qataris have definitely sponsored terrorists in the past as well. And this is very well known. It's almost undeniable. 
but the U.S. will not list them as state sponsors of terrorism. That again, that's not a criticism of the U.S. in any way. I don't want to present it as such. It's, it's just a fact. Um, Sudan, by the way, was recently removed from this uh, from this list uh, by Trump's order. So you can see that uh, the list is very political. It's that's a very um, a politicized list. So it's important to understand that. And just as an example, as we're talking about the state sponsorship of terrorism, how the money is used. And again, this is this is also very uh, complex because it's some of the money. It doesn't just when you say that it's uh, going to terrorism, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to a direct attack or to weapons. For instance, for Iran, their support of Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon amounts to around seven hundred million dollars. But that doesn't mean that all of that money is necessarily going to weapons, it also goes to salaries. And you'll see the distinction between operational and infrastructural costs later on in this presentation, but it's important to note. So when you say that, um, you know, in Afghanistan, um, Iran spends around $2 million on organization, they're just the same. It, it's not all weaponized. It's a lot of this is simply salaries and computers to conduct the work, cell phone bills, uh, office office uh, buildings, office furniture, all these things, they go into a terrorist organization that you don't really think of all the time. Um, this, this, is what, um, a, this is what the terror financing goes to. I also want to note that, and, and it might be obvious to many, but there's also drawbacks in every for, form of terror financing. And the drawback with having a state-sponsored terrorism is that it will dry out completely once the, um, that state is no longer needing your services, so to speak. So if um, you, we've seen a lot of different terrorist groups that um, essentially their state sponsor decide, well, we don't need you anymore against our enemy because we resolve the we resolve things peacefully or there's been a regime change. So then even though you might have ideological differences with your state sponsor, you've, you've lost uh, money because of something that, that uh, they resolved. And um, essentially what happens is they, they end up controlling you. It takes away your independence, but at the same time you have a lot deeper pockets. So uh, it's pluses and minuses for a terrorist group. Now we move on to illegal activities. And this is really important. There's a lot of, especially um, um, with, well, well, actually with all terrorist organizations, but um, uh, we saw this a lot with FARC, um, as well as with uh, the Taliban, that there's um, a huge source of the funding is from illegal money. So not state sponsors and not NGOs. Um, and this could be anything, any legal activity that generates money um, is also is, is, uh, is an illegal activity that helps raise the funds for terrorism or could be. So you find illegal trade, illegal trade in oil, charcoal, um, blood diamonds, ivory, um, as we saw with ISIS back in uh, about five, six years ago, and the trade of, um, of antiquities was a big source of funds for them as well. And you'll see that in the chart later. Uh, narco terrorism, as it's been known, is the, when when terrorist organizations sell drugs. So the Taliban uh, gets around seventy to four hundred million dollars per year from its sale, from its illegal sale of, of uh, narcotics. And um, the and 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 FARC in Colombia is estimated to have around two hundred sixty-seven million dollars per year from drug trafficking alone. And that doesn't include illegal mining that they do, extortions, uh, abductions, and just general fraud. So there's, um, there's a, a, a lot of this and it's, it's important to understand that just because you're an Islamic organization or you might, seem, you might have a ideology that opposes narcotics, which a lot of nationalist organizations have, for instance, um, it doesn't mean that you're beyond using it for money because in, in their mind, uh, the ends justify the means. And, and again, I mentioned a few organizations that profit off of illegal activities, but um, there, there's many others, uh, the ETA as well, the PKK, they all um, have benefited from, uh, from uh, narcotics. And it's, it's a lot easier for organizations that have some sort of territorial control as well, especially ones that are along the border. That's why PKK makes a lot of money for it in Colombia as well, because they have that territory that could, because FARC has that territory, they can do that. Um, and I mentioned extortion briefly. It's important to, to touch on that. Uh, it's one of the main sources of funds from uh, for ETA um, in Basque and in Basque country in Spain, and um, it's also a big for, form of uh, source of funds for um, for uh, for the PKK. And um, I remember back in the '90s, the Chechen groups that are operating in uh, in Russia were also using. Um, extortion a lot and uh, as well as abductions 
And um, there's there's a story I read a long time ago that uh, Hezbollah in the tribe warrior area in Latin America, that uh, they would go to Lebanese businessmen. So this is actually interesting because they're illegally extorting money from legal entities. So essentially uh, a Lebanese businessman who has a legal business, uh, Hezbollah would send operatives to him with a check written out with a certain amount and just basically give it to him for a signature so they can use that check uh, to support Hezbollah. So it's kind of like an interesting mix of using um, legal money, but extorting from them. So I always found that interesting. Um, there's also, now that we're talking about legal origins of funds, um, again, I brought up uh, legitimate businesses such as car dealerships, gas stations, and things like that. Um, but a big part of the legal origins of funds are from NGOs and NPOs. And the reason this is the case is because of the, the ideological nature of um, terrorist organizations. So uh, it, it inspires people, even though the actions might seem uh, violent to many other people, it inspires uh, members of the public who have uh, similar ideologies or who are sympathetic um, to donate to these causes. And that means that you can have, you can sustain uh, an NGO that's mostly focusing on funding a group that others consider terrorist or organization. Uh, there's some very popular cases of this. For instance, um, the Holy Land Foundation, um, which its statement was to find and implement practical solutions for human suffering through humanitarian programs that impact the lives of the disadvantaged, disinherited, and displaced people suffering from man-made and natural disasters. Now, if you read that, it sounds like uh, something that a good, a good Samaritan would like to donate to. But in the end, it was uh, an organization that was found to be supporting, um, supporting Hamas. And um, there, are other, there are others like it. Uh, if, there was an organization in the US called NORAID, um, which, stands, which was the Irish Northern Aid Committee. And um, for a while, they were attached to the terrorist list because of their alleged support for, um, for the Irish Republican Army. Um, also, the IIRO, which is uh, the International Islamic Relief Organization of Saudi Arabia, and for a long time, they were, they were also on the list for their alleged support for terrorism. They were eventually removed in 2014. So it took about uh, 13 years for them to be removed from the list. But it's a, it's a really big um, aid organization. And they were, they were implicated in supporting Al-Qaeda uh, and other terrorist groups, such as in, in, in the Philippines, for instance, such as uh, the Moral Islamic Liberation Front and Abu Sayyaf. So these are all legitimate organizations in a way, at least on paper, they're NGOs, um, normal good hearted people might donate to them without even knowing what's happening because they're not advertising their activities as supporting terrorism. So good hearted people, good natured people might be donating to a cause, um, hoping that it will go to something good, but in the end it goes to terrorism. Uh, in addition, when we're talking about legal origins, uh, some terrorist groups have businesses. So if they're not extorting businesses, they might also have their own businesses such as uh, Hezbollah there through, through various subsidiaries, they own uh, a pharmaceutical company, Shahid Farm, which uh, basically translates to Martyrs Fund, uh, Martyrs Farm, um, and Al Alamana uh, Petroleum. So Hezbollah has really a, a lot of businesses under them through different uh, subsidiaries, but uh, a lot of their money does come from what otherwise seems like legal, legal uh, and legitimate businesses. Um, another or another legal origin of funds um, comes from uh, m money that's donated by the encouragement of social media. And sometimes this could also be cryptocurrencies. So for instance, uh, we saw this a lot recently with Hamas, uh, where they just openly stated in Telegram channels and uh, in Twitter that um, they're asking for donations for the Palestinian resistance and people, ordinary people who support Hamas did donate to the cause. And what's interesting with this, a lot of times, and this also touches on the point of why, um, uh, why a lot of the, uh, why a lot of terrorist organizations get, um, get donations. It's basically, it's because people align with them ideologically and it's encouraged to align with them ideologically. You can see in this tweet here, um, for those who understand Arabic, it, it, you can tell it's a Quranic verse. Um, it, the beginning basically uh, states that you need to give to charity, you need to give to charitable causes. Um, and at the bottom of it, it exp the, there's an explanation of how to do it. There's an email and there's um, a, a request to basically donate to, uh, to the Palestinian cause, but it's from, um, 
uh, Al Qassam brigades, which is uh, part of which is part of uh, Hamas. So, again, the funds here are are totally legal. It's essentially someone who reads this on Twitter, who might have some Bitcoin, who might donate through other means. Uh, in the past, you can donate through PayPal, and they're just they say, you know what, I I support this cause. Um, I don't like what I'm what I'm seeing that's happening in uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, so I'm going to send some money to this uh, to this Bitcoin account. So now we've gone over the the three different origins of the funds. I want to talk a bit about um, a. I want to give some examples that uh, some diagrams that really kind of help drive the message home. So you can see for Al Qaeda, uh, there's a lot more when you compare them with FARC, with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. You can see that there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more origins of funds that come from charitable donations, be it from individual uh, charitable organizations or from individuals who um, who are donating um, as, a, as a person and not part of an entity who are just sending donations. They also do, do, do have uh, front companies such as, uh, interestingly enough, honey shops, which actually is exactly what it sounds like. They were selling honey and that money was going directly to Al Qaeda. But you just see that a lot of the money they received uh, was from people who sympathize with them ideologically. Whereas uh, compared to the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, their money came a lot from uh, taxes on territory, from cocaine trade, from gold mines and uh, kidnap for ransom. And, and simply put, um, it's in a way a lot more agreeable uh, to support an Islamic cause the way it is today um, than it is for someone to support uh, a communist uh, sort of territorial armed group like FARC. And that, that's the reason. In the end of the day, the reason you see the distinction between the two groups is because of the, the, the breadth of ideological uh, alignment for one versus the other. So one can ask in a way and one can receive because people want to support the cause. And the other one, it's a bit less likely um, and it's also a much more narrow thing. There aren't going to be, with, when it comes to uh, Islamic organizations, you're going to have people throughout the world who want to support it. There aren't that many people throughout the world who are going to want to support FARC because it's, it's a very narrow cause compared to Al-Qaeda. So that's the reason that their activities uh, depend on some, um, first of their control over, over territory so they can actually tax it, but also through illegal operations, but they can only do that because they do have territory. That said, I do want to talk about an Islamic organization that does have, uh, that did have territorial control. And uh, this also shows a more nuanced breakdown of their money. And you can also see that from them, 33% of their funds were from taxes and fees. And the reason they were able to do that is because they, they also held on to territory. So that's what happens when you, when you hold territory, when you govern, uh, you, you can receive money through different things because you actually have people who have to pay you. You're their governor, you're the government now. It also, just like FARC, it gave them access to natural resources. So FARC can mine, uh, but ISIS had, had access to oil. They also, through, through the capture of territory with the antiquities in it that they, now over, that they now oversee, they obtained a lot of money through that. Even though it's just 1%, it's still in the millions of dollars. And it's important to note. And they also charge people, um, so they didn't do the work on their own sometimes, they would charge people a sort of uh, a fee to take antiquities and sell it. They also received donations, but a lot less than Al-Qaeda. And 35% were from just uh, from, from other activities as well. So it just goes to show that a few things will determine in a way um, how you raise your funds. Um, first off, the, the, the broad, uh, the wide amount of ideological um, sympathizers with you and also what you have access to. If you don't have access to territory, there's a lot of things that you're, that you're limited in as far as uh, raising funds for terrorist activities. Another example I want to give, and just uh, to, to give more nuanced uh, illustrations of all the points I was talking about, um, was that uh, FARC between 1996 and 2012 earned more than 1.1 billion US dollars through ransom payments, which is why it was one of the most important uh, generators of income for them. Um, likewise, they it, compar comparatively, it's a lot smaller, but they still got around $5.3 million through illegal mining, which is, which is still an important uh, source of funds for them. Also, when they were demobilized in 2016, it was reported that they were that they had 276 kilos in uh, gold reserves, uh, which in today's market is worth around 12.6 million dollars. So, uh, again, the, the the control of the territory and um, 
the ability to conduct these illegal activities with impunity was really the, the, the it really um, gave them the ability to operate the way they did. So we talked about the origins of, uh, of funds for terrorist organizations. And we talked about how they're raised. Um, I wanna talk briefly about, I wanna speak briefly about how they're transferred. Now, this is an interesting subject because this is also where um, a lot of times it is aligned with uh, money laundering to some extent. It really just, uh, it really just depends on the organization, how much money we're talking about and, and, and uh, what kind of access they have. So naturally in the case of the formal banking system, this could be uh, conducted in many ways. Firstly, if they have the support of a government, it's easy to transfer funds through the banking system. Uh, depends which banking system depends how international um, how international it is, but um, naturally the you know when Iran sponsors a terrorist organization they can they can use a banking system in order to transfer money to Hezbollah. Just like with uh, money laundering, there's also other means such as false trade invoicing. So if you have money and you want to uh, you want to basically um, especially if it's illegal money and you want to use it, you do have to take it through a money laundering process. And false trade, trade invoicing is something that's really common in the money laundering world, where essentially you misinvoice something in order to um, allow someone to have more of a product than, um, than they paid for, or the other way around, where you charge them more than what you're, than what you're supplying them with. Um, and this could also be for services. So essentially you can provide someone with the service have them uh, invoice or not provide someone the service, but have them invoice you for a service that was not conducted. And that's how uh, you justify the sources of money, the source of money. And this again, it's a very important and very normal part of money laundering that terrorist finance terror financers can also use in order to bring the money uh, to clean up the money that was generated illegally, or that's going to be used illegally. There's also uh, money service businesses. Um, this is a very common part of, uh, of uh, in money laundering as well, but in terror finance, we see it. It basically refers to currency dealers or exchangers. Um, and, it's, um, and it's used because a lot of times there's very weak KYC policies applied for money service businesses, which is something that we're seeing is changing. It's also informal value transfer systems in the Islamic world, and especially in, uh, sub in the Indian subcontinent. This could be referred to as halawa. Um, and essentially, it's, it's a trust-based network of exchanging money. It's also very unregulated. Nowadays, there are, the different governments are working on bringing it under stricter regulation, but in the meantime, it's, it's not so strict. So um, it is very commonly used um, by terrorist organizations. Um, and also, lastly, I want to bring up uh, cash couriers. So it depends on the type of funds, depends on if it is in cash, depends on how much cash. It depends on the price of the, the, the act that's being conducted is going to cost or it depends on the, the general spending. Um, but cash is still used. Cash is used very frequently and it's um, something that in order to move around, you do need cash couriers uh, who smuggle money in the traditional way, either through uh, cross-border networks uh, or through hiding it uh, on, their, on their person or in their suitcases when they travel. So this is, this is uh, very traditional, very well known and um, uh, still a common part of transferring money for terrorist financing purposes. So lastly, I want to talk about uh, the use of funds. So I, I alluded to this earlier when, uh, when we were speaking about um, um, the, the, the complexity of uh, defining how much money goes to a terrorist organization and keeping in mind that some of that money is for weapons and arms and some of that is simply for uh, just maintaining the organization. And a lot of this will depend on the size of the organization. Um, for instance, ISIS maintained government offices. ISIS paid salaries. ISIS is distributed fishing licenses. ISIS had a full territory with, with schools and teachers and things like that, even though it's a terrorist organization. So a lot of their costs are going to go through to infrastructure relative to operations. Um, you know, it can go for apartments and go for office buildings, like I was mentioning earlier. Meanwhile, operational expenses are more directly tied to actual conducting of a terrorist attack itself, be it travel to the location, the explosives that go into the vehicle, the other weapons that, you're, that are going to be used, the transportation, things like that. So those are the operational expenses versus uh, the infrastructure expenses. And, I, and it might surprise some, and again, this really just depends on the organization, but in some cases, such as uh, the case of Al-Qaeda, the, the distribution leans very heavy in the infrastructural size. 
in the infrastructural side. And th this could make sense if you, if you take a moment and think about what goes in, into infrastructure and the frequency of terrorist attacks also. So if you have a terrorist organization and you're maintaining a, a PR channel, if you're um, you know, paying people um, for, for those purposes, if you're paying protection networks, uh, if you're running training facilities and then things like that, naturally that's gonna amount to more money uh, every month than the occasional terrorist attacks that you conduct, especially bearing in mind the cost of those terrorist attacks. You know, one month's rent on an office building somewhere in southern Turkey costs uh, more than a vehicle bomb in Iraq. So you can understand the distribution and, and it's important to know. So now that hopefully we have a better understanding of the inner workings of terror financing and the, the different terrorist groups, I want to bring this back to our industry, to the industry of uh, to, to compliance and KYC. So I want to talk a bit about uh, the red flags and how they might appear in various phases. Um, like I said, when you do uh, research uh, and trying to identify counter-terror financing, a lot of there there might be a lot of overlap with um, the, with the methodologies they use for for anti-money laundering research, just the same. And, and that's why they're often associated with each other. That's why the regulators treat them so similarly, but they are a bit distinct. Um, and it's also important, and I, I say this all the time, and this goes with sanctions, this goes with money laundering and with terror finance as well, that a red flag is, is just a red flag. It's important. It's important to draw your attention. That's what it does. Um, and kind of identify a certain direction of research or certain things to dig further into. But a red flag should not be a, mean, a reason to dismiss someone altogether. If you're looking at a prospect and you see some of these red flags, that does not mean that their money is going to terror financing uh, or to anything illegal or anything that uh, will get you in trouble or them in trouble. Um, and whether or not you choose to proceed that with them really just depends on your own risk appetite. So that's important to note. I wanna say that uh, one of the biggest differences that you'll find um, and biggest indicators that can separate money laundering from terror financing is ideology. So it's something that you'll see in, um, in, in terror finance research that you won't see as much with other ones. So um, just a few things to look into when you're, when you're onboarding a potential client, for instance, and I'll, I'll show you a list in a moment is um, uh, one's business associates and other connections. And the reason you're doing this is because it's not just the person himself or herself that might be connected to, connected to terrorists directly, it might be through other people. And um, if you find that their associates or their connections are somehow implicated in, in, in terrorism or terrorist organizations, then it might be a red flag that their money is going through that as well. Um, so that's important to know. Uh, organizational membership is also very important. Like I said, a lot of NGOs and otherwise uh, charitable organizations or char uh, charitable uh, entities um, or ideological entities are involved in, in um, so, or in some way connected to terrorism. So it's important to understand if someone, if you're looking at someone's profile and you understand the different memberships they have, the different connections that they have uh, to, to various organizations, understand what that organization is. Ask yourself that question, understand who's involved in it, understand what they've been implicated with in the past. Do a thorough research on it, do your due diligence. Uh, jurisdiction is, of course, very important, um, but uh, oftentimes overemphasized. It is something to understand if someone's operating in an area um, with, a, with a high level of risk for uh, terror financing. A lot of people operate in those areas as well. And it's, it's again, it's over-exaggerated because a lot of times you'll see someone operating in Lebanon and that they think, and because of that, it's a higher risk for terrorism. But Lebanon, uh, sorry, Hezbollah also has a lot of people um, in Venezuela or in, in Senegal and other places where there is a big expat community. So that's not, um, I think ju jurisdictional red flag is oftentimes oversimplified um, and also just in a way kind of unfair to determine that someone um, is a higher risk just because they're operating in a certain jurisdiction. By itself, it doesn't mean so much. Um, also source of wealth uh, is, is, is generally very important whenever you're doing a due diligence research and with terror financing, it, it's, it's uh, the same, especially if you're looking into a, a company, understand where their money comes from, or if you're looking for an, into an NGO, understand where their money comes from. Um, Cause it can, this can also indicate some connections to, to terrorists or uh, to other terrorist organizations. And also in the media profile, so a lot of times if someone is a high net worth individual or an ultra high net worth individual, you'll find certain um, 
you'll, fi you'll find that they do have a media profile. And if this person is somehow connected to terrorists or, there's a, or there is suspicion that this person is connected to terrorists, and this is a hot button issue, so it will be discussed. You will find this oftentimes. Uh, so it's important to do so, and it's also important to do so in various languages. And these are all, these are all uh, critical parts of the onboarding process. Again, be it for a terror financing or anti-money laundering or sanctions evasion and everything like that. So uh, just to kind of summarize the, the flow and the way that um, your direction should be when you're doing compliance research like this, uh, if you're looking into a company or an NPO or an NGO, you want to understand the full picture, who are their owners, their clients, um, the subsidiaries, also the region of activity, um, who, who are their vendors. Um, and oftentimes when you find that person or if you're looking at a person uh, individually, you want to find the companies they're involved in, their business partners, you want to look into their family members, uh, any again, organizational memberships, you want to understand any, um, any indications of ideologies that they may have, um, be it nationalistic, religious, political, you want to understand how much they're involved in that and understand also the context. If, if this ideology that they have is associated or the organization that they're, they're in is associated with terrorism in the given jurisdiction that they operate in, this is something that you need to be aware of. Um, essentially, you need to find the full profile of this person and um, everything that he's involved in to get to a place of confidence to uh, conduct business or not conduct business with him or her. And uh, in order to find all this information, one of the most important things to do is to cross-reference. And just as a starting point, um, the sources you want to cross-reference are uh, corporate records, company filings, press reports, social media accounts, be it about that person or his or her own social media accounts or um, uh, the social media accounts of uh, family members or close friends. Again, you really want to treat uh, this as a, an open research project. You want to you want to look into the individual, look into the company, and uh, dot every I, cross every T, and understand fully everything you read about them. You want to understand their full story as if you're doing a mini biography on them. And uh, in the process, if you can find anything that indicates that his or her money might um, go towards terrorist organizations, or that um, especially if it's an organization, that their money might be used for the for the support of terrorism. So all that is uh, very important. And I hope by now there's some things that are clear and I'm sure that there are a lot of questions and I'm happy to answer all of them. Again, it's a very broad subject and uh, a lot of things to touch on. So I try to cover as much as I can in the time I had, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Thanks, Lev. Um, we've got one question here. Um, you can continue to send in your questions and as they come, um, I'll forward them to Lev. Um, the first question we've received is, you talked a bit about the role of financial institutions. What other types of companies might come under the scrutiny of counter terror finance regulations like social media companies? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think from a, from a financial perspective, um, and this is, this is um, me taking a stab at this question, I'm not very sure, but I think from a financial perspective, um, if you're talking about social media companies allowing terrorists to use them, if that's the question, like for instance, uh, if Hamas, uh, yeah, if Hamas uh, for instance, is uh, using um, a social media to raise funds, I don't think it's on them from a financial regulation perspective to shut down the account. I think it's on them um, it's all it's it's complicated because I think that's an ideological um, a sign that I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of uh, what Twitter has been doing recently, for instance. I think it's on them. I don't think there's any laws that say that you can't use a platform to to share a message, especially in the West or in the US. Um, but and I don't think that their platform is the one that's uh, raising funds. It's the whatever cryptocurrency company that they're using or um, whatever other digital transfer company, it's their responsibility. Potentially, um, it's the responsibility of Twitter if they see something like that to inform authorities. And I think typically they do, because I should have mentioned this earlier uh, when, I was, when I was showing the request for donations, but um, these accounts do get shut down. If Twitter sees them, they, they, I was able to get screenshots of them because naturally people find them, but once, they get enough attention, they are shut down. And Bitcoin actually, to their credit, uh, cooperates with authorities on these matters and they will also you know, uh, shut, down, shut down these accounts and uh, cooperate with authorities in finding um, uh, 
the the origins and not allowing it to go to its destination. So I hope, I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions. I think I think they might be related, um, and but maybe not. Maybe you'll have a different understanding. But I'll give them both to you, and you can see. Um, one of the question is, how do you go about dual purpose goods? And then the other question is, um, what are red flags for um, transactions concerning legal activities? Interesting point. So um, it seems like two separate questions. The, the first one, um, sorry, remind me what the first one was? How do you go about dual purpose goods? Okay. So dual purpose, um, it's, it's, in general, what you have to understand from the perspective of the regulators is that you put in your effort. Um, you, especially the list of dual purpose, I, um, actually it's very interesting because it touches on my previous job in the UN where we actually worked with the Israeli government on minimizing, like lowering the list of uh, things that are dual purpose. In general, if it's a government that doesn't uh, like you as a terrorist organization, everything could be considered dual purpose. That means a radio, that means a video camera, any single thing is very easy to add to a list of dual purpose things, dual purpose items. And um, you don't get in trouble for supplying someone with something that is dual purpose, be it a vehicle that's used as a, as a, as a, as a weapon um, or even a kitchen knife used as a weapon or, or um, I guess chemicals that, could, that have legitimate purposes but are used as weapons. Um, the reg regulators and governments are very aware that it's impossible for someone who's selling um, legitimate chemical products to know if it's going to be used um, uh, for weapons. And it's not exactly on um, the supplier to make that call a lot of times. It's more on the government can decide uh, that uh, we need to regulate this product because it's used oftentimes uh, for the creation of weapons. Um, and remind me the second question. Um, what are red flags for transactions involving legal um like legal transactions, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like uh, uh, taking money that was obtained legally and sending it. Um, yeah, from a, I assume from a financial pers um, financial institution's perspective. Um, I see, I see. The what question. are red flags yeah. to look for? So in that case, you you would have to see um, the organization that there's, they're sending it to and uh, the purpose of it. So it's, um, it's, there's a distinction between onboarding red flags and transactional red flags. And uh, it's, it's difficult, especially if the organization is considered legitimate and it's uh, an approved organization. Um, and a lot of legitimate organizations, you know, kind of similar to dual purpose uh, items, they're dual purpose organizations that might be completely legitimate and supplying aid, but they're also supporting terrorism. So I guess that is to say that it's very difficult. Um, again, if you're if you're trans if a transaction from a legitimate business to a legitimate organization or to a legitimate person, um, and the 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 purpose seems legitimate, it's hard to find. Sometimes, what you can see is um, patterns um, or a lack of connection. If there's no connection between person A and person B, but person A continues to bring the same amount of money at a certain interval of time, uh, perhaps for the same uh, exact uh, purchase or for the same exact uh, reason. But it doesn't seem to make sense. Like, why is this person regularly supplying this person, uh, this organization, with X amount of money, which seems to be for a service or seems to be for a specific cause? But they're doing with regularity that doesn't make sense um, for what it is. Um, essentially, it with uh, red flags, you have to ask yourself: Does this make sense? Does the does the does the the figure itself make sense? Does it um, uh, does it align with this with this person's uh, previous transactions and things like that? But I have to admit, it's a, it's a, it's difficult to um, to identify concrete red flags um, in those kind of transactions. And a related question to that um, is asking about how can you, um, what's the best sources for finding out about those illegal activities? Assuming that the like NGO charities and all the all the transactions up to that point are legal. Um, how's the best way to find out about illegal activities is social media, press, or other types of sources? So personally, um, it depends on which country, but in, in, in most countries that I've looked into NGO activity for, um, they're very transparent about their activities in a way. Um, the activities that they're, they're, they're formal activities, like where their money is, uh, 
who they receive their money from and where their, where does their money go to, which is also complex because they're, you know, they're, they're so trans transparent and so uh, open about their money, but you still don't know what's actually being, what's actually happening um, on the ground. As far as illegal activities, um, definitely just like with, uh, I would say you check social media and regular media, both of them and in multiple languages, but also do so with a grain of salt because it's important to note that an NGO that's supplying, uh, that's supplying uh, humanitarian aid or relief uh, to a conflict area is always subject to accusations um, and including government and so governmental accusations. So if you have an organization um, in Somalia that support, that's uh, supplying aid to a certain area that's under um, Al-Shabaab control, for instance, then it's, uh, it's naturally going to uh, receive criticism from, um, from different people in the media that, oh, it's actually not supplying the individuals there, but supporting Al-Shabaab. And so what I'm saying is that you, you definitely need to look into social media look into, uh, you know, news articles and even government press releases to an extent, but also take it with a heavy grain of salt. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we need to wrap up. We're coming towards the end here. We have some other questions on related, but I think uh, most of the concerns here were about red flags. Um, and I think you did a, a good job of answering that. Um, if you want to advance to the next slide, if you have it. Um, just before we go, um, I wanted to give a reminder um, to those of you who joined us um, of our portal where you can order um, reports directly and, and submit your requests. Um, I think that Lev did a good job of highlighting the need for enhanced due diligence and um, especially emphasizing that uh, when it comes to terror finance, um, the databases are just the start, you know, looking through those databases of, of known terrorists and um, all the political reasons that Lev demonstrated why um, that's insufficient. Um, so we encourage you to seek enhanced due diligence, especially for the purpose of driving business. Um, and, and we feel confident that we can help you do that um, in most regions of the world. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lev, for a very interesting um, presentation. Um, in a lot of ways, I think that it sort of um, got the wheels turning in and prompted more questions and, and more curiosity in my mind um, than when we started. But um, that's, a, that's a good morning for me. So uh, I appreciate that a lot. And uh, thank you all so much. Uh, for joining us and look forward to being in touch with you soon. Thank you all. Thank you, Catherine.